Hello, hello. Uh, welcome to episode 108 of uh, Linux Let's. You can tell that I'm not Shane or Connor, and that just means that uh, they are both gallivanting somewhere, sending their arses in some places nicer than... Uh, I don't know even where I was going with it. Anyway, I'm Mike, and with me here today is Amolith. Hi, Amolith. Hello. And yes, yeah, so we decided that we will talk about a few things. Let's start with you. So you are currently working on something called Willow. So Willow is going to be a an open source product that my company is developed, and my company name is is named after a tree. So I want to name the company's products after trees as well. So I've been a sysadmin for like five, six years, something like that. And the biggest annoyance I've had in all that time is keeping up with releases of the software I run. If that software is developed and released on GitHub, GitHub has RSS feeds for releases. More recently, GitT and Forgeo have added dedicated RSS feeds for their releases as well. But GitLab just has an API you can query. If the software is developed just like with raw Git and a C Git front end, there's nothing. There is only Git. There is no RSS feed. There's no API. Absolutely nothing. So what I'm developing Willow to do is go back to the fundamentals and support the lowest common denominator between as many of the different platforms as possible. Just bare Git. If the platform has an RSS feed, cool, we'll use that. But the priority is going to be solid support for Git. So it doesn't matter where it is, if you can git clone it, you can track the releases using regular git tags. And a lot of the platforms like GitHub and GitT, when you create a new release, it will automatically create a tag in that repo, and whatever your release notes are, it'll add that as an annotation to the git tag. So Willow uses git tags and the annotation related to that tag to figure out those release notes and expose them to the user in one cohesive UI. And eventually, I might support other version control systems like Mercurial and Fossil and some other stuff. We'll see. Right now, I'm just focusing on Git. So you have, obviously, one part of your of the software that you're developing is grabbing this, all of these sorts of, of data. Uh, what does the the user end look like? What What would the sysadmin using Willow, what they would be looking at? I have no clue. I haven't gotten to the front end yet. I'm just trying to make sure the back end has a solid structure and actually functions. When I first started actually working on Willow, I hired a friend of mine as a consultant, and he did a great job at at giving me some blinders, perceptual blinders, to say, don't worry about the front end until the back end is solid. Don't worry about the licensing until the back end is solid. Don't worry about the branding until the back end is solid. The product is the back end. That's what actually matters. The rest of it is important, but it's really ancillary to the back end. I have seen a few times, and everybody who uses a lot of open source software has seen a few times when this thinking got to things that have got great backends. But the user experience is not ideal. But obviously, you're nowhere there. So you're thinking about the backend first. And um, I assume that would be running on a server as a continuous job that would be collecting feeds. Yes. Is it is it very common that you install on a server, or maybe in your case, in an LXC container or LXD container, something that comes straight for Git? For me, yes. The majority of what I run is straight from Git, not packaged anywhere yet. Sometimes they will have their own Debian package, but not their own Debian repo, in which case you still have to track the releases yourself and download that new Deb package for every release. When they have a repo, it's nice you can just APT upgrade or or whatever. But even then, Debian isn't everything. There are systems other than Debian. Yeah, that's not what I thought. So I kind of assumed that, especially in the world where... Uh, you kind of need reliability, security, some kind of an assumption of of service. You know, even though it's all open source, I kind of would have assumed that people who make this kind of software, their first uh, kind of packaging way would be trying to get it into the distributions. You might think so, but getting custom software packaged in your distribution is is difficult. It's a very long, arduous process. And most of the time, developers are not the one packaging their software for a distribution anyway. It's going to be that distribution's package maintainers. 
And if a package maintainer isn't exactly interested in that project, they're not going to package it. Yeah, this is what snaps obviously were meant to solve, but obviously the situation is not solved. So you are trying to help people out with the mess that we have right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm also actually help it, trying to help distribution package maintainers. I've actually had a Slackware package maintainer reach out to me and ask to be kept up to date with the progress because he wants to use it to get notified when the packages he maintains have a new upstream release so he can package it for Slackware. Hmm, that's very nice of you. That's that's an interesting, definitely an interesting project. And uh, I can, I didn't even think about the distribution maintainers angle, but yeah, definitely you only have a bootstrapping problem when you when you release your own version first time the first time you will need to i don't know contact the maintainer the other way some other way but once they have it uh you just need to you can include even your own releases in it uh so do you how how kind of far with it are you not very far <laughs> i've had this idea for years literally and just started executing on it maybe a month ago Fetching releases via RSS and Git both work reliably. They're solid, but that's all there is at the moment. That core functionality is there, and now it's time to start building out the rest of the stuff. Users, authentication, having organizations, users who can belong to those organizations. There's a lot of stuff I want to build in that would make it much more attractive to businesses, but as it is right now, it meets my absolute minimum needs for tracking what I need. So what kind of a technology or what, what, what are you making it in? I, g I give you one guess. I assume you, it being you, then it's all written in Go. Yes. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, you were never going to make it in Java. Were you? <laughs> Absolutely not. I know you, you are not thinking of the front end as much as yet, but what's your take on trying to use as a small a technology stack as possible as in if you can make absolutely everything in go then all it will, it will be all in go or are you going to try to figure out what is the best technology for each part and if it means that you end up working in uh, god forbid react or something you will <laughs> you will basically make it in that so the right now the extremely minimal front end is just handwritten html and css and it's using go's templating system in various places throughout the HTML files, there are variables, I guess. The, the, the template inserts variables for particular fields. I like that, but it's not exactly maintainable long term when you start needing to scale out and make large uh, changes across the entire front end, like changing a, a meta tag. For example, you, you, you might have to touch 50 HTML files to make that change. Just the idea that you would make like a comprehensive dashboard, you know, maybe with some nice uh, real-time graphs and stuff or charts. Uh, yeah, the problem is it wouldn't scale. No, I don't think so. You might have to take a preact. <laughs> I don't know. I do have a friend who's a, a professional front-end web developer who mm. and she has expressed interest in helping me. So we'll... I'll talk with her about it and, and we'll figure something out. So do you kind of have a, in your, in your head, do you have a deadline for this when you would like to uh, make a first release or? November, the Ubuntu Summit, because I'm giving a talk on it. Oh, yes, of course. That is my deadline. I, I want like the minimum features to be a pleasant experience by November. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That makes sense. So you know what you're doing, you know, you, you have an idea how to do it. How about the sales kind of side of things? Because that's something, uh, if you have an open source project and people will come and use it, but if you want to sell to enterprise, do you have, do you have a sales experience or do you know how to approach that kind of side of things? Nope, not a clue. <laughs> in, in this situation, I'm wanting to make it so it meets my needs and is pleasant for me to use. And at the moment it meets my needs, it's not exactly pleasant to use yet. That's the part that's next. Mm -hmm. At at that point, I'll start adding more business-focused features like OpenID Connect, integration with some kind of LDAP system or Active Directory, all that mess, uh, single sign-on. I don't want to operate it like a startup is what it comes down to. I don't like startups. I want slow, organic growth, not 
rocket ship shoot for the moon as many users as possible as quickly as possible backed by vc money we'll figure out how to fund it later yeah i think that ship has passed uh the, the money is no longer there so <laughs> yeah. you, anyway if you, if you want it to so now unfortunately for everybody now the software that's being made is actually going to have to be useful mm -hmm. i know it's a bit of a bummer but <laughs> i i don't know how feasible it would be it's just kind of a thought in the back of my mind at the moment i want there to be an open source version that small businesses and nonprofits can use if it's a big business i'd like them to pay for it but i also want there to be a software as a service model and i would like to offer that software as a service to package maintainers for free i don't know how feasible that would be but that's something i'd like to do I want to take the same approach for this that I took for NixNet. Build it and they'll come. Okay. But in this case, when they come, they would have to be either someone knowledgeable about systems administration who wants to run it themselves, so they'll go with the open source route, or they want me to run it for them, software as a service. I'm creating the product, the cohesive experience. They want that, they pay for it, or they're a big business and they want to use it at work, they're going to pay for it. I don't want to do marketing, advertising, and maybe I'm being naive. I don't know. Like I said, my priority is just making it work and be pleasant for me. If it also works and is pleasant for other people, cool. Maybe I'll make some money, but as long as it meets my needs, great. Okay, yes, that, that looks like a decent idea. Well, you know, I take it from me, a person who knows absolutely nothing, but you seem to have a use case and a... Uh and an idea, like you are actually filling a niche that, that's not filled by anything that exists. So that that is, at least for me, things like this have got a chance of succeeding. And then again, it's up to you how you define success, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So are you taking contributions now? I probably won't take contributions right now. Not, not until it gets to an okay state by November. After that, sure. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that makes me believe that this could be a successful venture is, one, I've already had some people reach out and say they want to use it for maintaining a distribution. I've had a couple other people say, hey, can I, can, will you please charge me money so I can recommend this to my business so I can use this at work? And like, yes, that's exactly what I want. Not right now, but give me a few months and absolutely. The other thing is, it's an established enterprise product field. It's called, if I remember correctly, software lifecycle management. Mm -hmm. I know from like a uh, company where I work that reaching customers about updates is very difficult because you get a comp customer, you do some onboarding, and somebody signs up with an email address. And five years on, you still have the customer, but the person who is getting the email has moved on. Somebody else might be getting the email, but they don't know what the email means. And suddenly you realize that your customers are uh, haven't updated whatever it is you're making in the last three years because <laughs> nobody who should be reading these kind of emails was reading them and the person who was reading them might be just, you know, marking them as spam or something. So mm -hmm. it is a, uh, and I'd imagine this is so common that having an established procedure and tooling around it is actually massively helpful. And may maybe I build an email server in that lets you generate an email address. So <laughs> when you get those updates via email, they surface in the same UI alongside everything else. Mm -hmm. But then you, so you have multiple inputs. You can also have multiple outputs. You can mm -hmm. offer people APIs to, uh, or an RSS feed. That is exactly one of the things on my list to implement. There's actually a lot that I want to implement that I haven't talked about yet. Let me go through that really quickly. So we've got organizations, and those organizations can have multiple users in them, and a user can be part of multiple different organizations. That organization can indicate that, that a particular user is responsible for a piece of software or for a particular tag that might be associated with multiple pieces of software. That tag might be a server. So this software is running on servers A, B, C, and D. And if the user is responsible for that software, then they know it needs to be updated on A, B, C, and D. But if they're only responsible for server A, then they're going to see all the software that needs to be updated on that one particular server. And they can manage that, update everything, and, and whatnot. But I also want to have 
granularly configurable RSS feeds. So a, a user can get a fire hose of everything they're responsible for in one RSS feed, or they can get particular project updates in one RSS feed. In that situation, it might be an email gets translated to an RSS feed that shows up in their reader, or Git tag annotations get translated into an RSS feed that shows up in their reader. Hmm. That's, yeah, that, that sounds definitely interesting. One thing, aren't you worried that somebody, let's say, listen to this show and uh, will figure out, well, I have a bunch of developers and we can make it for September and that you, that you basically get, um, they get, they get snicked. I am convinced that I can do a better job slower than they could do faster. And in like the, the software business world, the first one who gets there succeeds and the second one usually doesn't. I don't care. If it works for me, it works for me. That's all I care about because I intend to use this for my business as well and offer it as a service to my business's customers as well. So last time, basically, I thought I, I was talking about how I'm switching from my usual way of uh, doing things, i.e. using something like Fedora, going with Debian and instead of GNOME, which would have been my preferred uh, Linux environment for years, I'm now going with KDE. So my current setup, that's the almost 360 that I did in my uh, desktop uses. And I'm also with programming languages. You know, I've, I've had a look at Go. I've previously had a good look at Rust, always about the, the most kind of modern, newest thing of doi- doing things. I've never really had a strong desire to learn C. I've, I've kind of always considered it, not that the death of C is imminent, because there's just so much stuff written on it, including the kernel, but, you know, that I might not actually be able to utilize it anywhere. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so... I, uh, again, did a 360, almost 360, because I'm not learning C, but I'm learning HAIR, which is a programming language that is meant to be a very slight improvement on C, right? And it's it's something that I would not normally consider for a few things. First off, it's only officially supported on Linux and BSDs on free operating systems. Mm -hmm. If I remember correctly, Drew created it, and he has no plans to support HAIR on any proprietary system. If you go to on that IRC, in the header, you know, the, every IRC channel has a header. And in this one, it says, we don't support macOS Windows. Do not ask. Yeah. So so I, I might back up a little bit. So this made by Drew DeWalt. I don't know how I would describe uh, Drew DeWalt except for being opinionated. He's the one who prefers traditional packaging format and the mechanisms of distributions over snaps. He is against things like proprietary software. He doesn't like CLAs. Mm-hmm. So he created this Herlang, which is a programming language that uh, looks a lot like C, functions a lot like C, only is officially supported on free operating systems, and I'm learning it. Why I'm learning, well, why I started was because I was curious. Why I stuck with it is because I actually found that there is no, there's no books, no tutorials. I don't think there are any videos. Basically, the amount of things that's ever been written on it is very small. But what there is, is the specs. And the specs are made for basically so that you can make a compiler, which I'm not planning on. Mm -hmm. It's very good. If you want to understand a language, I've never never read language specs before. But for this particular case, if you read through first through like the introduction that they have on their website, and then you go through the specs and actually take time to understand what it says. I find it conveys the knowledge or the idea much more uh, efficiently and meaningfully than, let's say, a tutorial would. Am I ever going to be able to actually utilize this? I don't know. As for the language itself, uh, syntax is very C-like. Memory management is manual. Higher data structures, uh, yeah, you make your own. It has got like primitive types and it has got uh, structs and tag unions, which are interesting. But if you want to make, uh, I don't know, on their, on their website, they mention an example of a hash map, you, you, make your, you make your own hash map. That kind of thinking. Interesting. Yeah, it, it, it is interesting. If you use Go, for example, Go won't let you do things like pointer arithmetics. And that's probably for a very good reason. The reason why there is a need for a new language, like the reason, you know, why would you not just use C is that you want things like uh, Unicode, for example. 
I'm not exactly sure how Unicode works in C. I'm not exactly sure if Unicode actually works in C very well. But in hair, uh, strings are Unicodes and runes are Unicode like in Go, right? Mm -hmm. But yes, basically, I'm trying a weird esoteric language that looks a bit like C and is probably not going. To, I'm probably not going to find many uses for it, but it's fun. Well, you run Linux. That means you can write utilities for yourself and anyone else running Linux. Yeah, but I kind of find that most utilities have already been written. Mm -hmm twice because you know you've got whatever has been written and now everything is being rewritten in rust or go yes <laughs> or or like in in terms of like top the venerable top there is about there's just like one version for each programming language h top b top g top yeah off the top of my head there are many others what i find and the hair will not help with this i think especially since i kind of spent a lot of time on or spending a lot of time in macOS. what i think is missing for desktop users is graphical user interface utilities although it's obviously getting better anyway so i'm i'm trying to learn this kind of thing you'll have to keep us updated on how hair goes i've been interested in it for a while but being strictly limited to Linux and FreeBSD is not what I want. All I use is Linux, but I still don't like being limited just by the language choice. So I'm not keen on the way they are talking about this. Um, I understood, I would understand if you'd say, look, I have no way of supporting Windows and um, and Mac and we are just not planning on it because, you know, it takes resources that we don't have. But that's different from saying we shall never uh, support a proprietary system. It's a bit, there's a bit of philosophy in it or, you know, basically just refusal rather than, yeah, I can't do it. I, I can respect sticking with your principles. I, I don't like it, though. <laughs> I respect it, but I don't like it. It basically sets a lot of boundaries to the usefulness of the whole project, which uh, might never be a problem if you are basically creating a system language for free Unices, or Unixes, then, uh, then, yeah, sure, it will work. I don't know what uh, Drew Devold's intentions with the language are, if he has a specific something that he wants to use. You know, he's he's writing a his own operating system or his own kernel or something I saw somewhere. But if you think that we need a specific language to write uh, specific Linux system utilities and specific, let's say, I don't know if kernel modules can be written in this yet, or, you know, it might find its use. In <laughs> yes. <laughs> Intentionally having a severely limited scope has some big benefits. Especially if your project is, like, if, you, if, if the amount of people helping you is small. Yes. Right. So, yeah, we, we will see. It is uh, coming from a very opinionated group of people, and that is not always a bad thing. It's like GNOME, for example, you know, whilst it puts off a lot of people uh, because of some limitations or things that are just not going to be considered, it also creates a really decent, let's say, stable or reliable project as long as you want to use it the way it's designed, right? So it is definitely an interesting approach. Mm hmm so yes, I think that's everything. Thank you for listening. It was a nice chat. I might, and yeah, I actually don't know how to sign off properly, so just <laughs> bye. I don't remember how we do it either. <laughs> Goodbye. Just, is there anything else you would like to add? Jesus, I'm running this like a meeting at work. <laughs>